welcome to our October Books and Coffee. And as always, I'd like to start out thanking the Friends of Concordia. Their support makes this series possible, so I'm very grateful for that. And if you're not a friend, there's always time to become one. Our guest tonight received high praise for Not That Kind of Girl, her memoir about growing up evangelical in a secular age. And now, with her first novel, Francis and Bernard, Carlene Bauer continues to impress readers and reviewers alike. She has been featured as a fresh voice in the New York Times book review and praised as a distinctive stylist who can write with wit and charm. Teresa Link of the Washington Post said she writes with authority and gusto about issues of faith. The prose exquisite, winding between narrative momentum and lofty introspection. And the Boston Globe declared her novel graceful and gem-like. Inspired by the lives of Flannery O'Connor and Robert Lowell, Bauer's characters, Francis and Bernard, meet at a writer's colony and then over the next 11 years continue their relationship through letters. I think Francis captures it best from the start. When she begins, it would be a pleasure to talk to you in letters and what a pleasure their correspondence is for the reader and painful too as they share their struggles with faith, love, friendship, and the writing mind. Their letters are powerful, intimate, emotional, revealing, dramatic, and compelling. There is much to consider in this slim book, not the least of which is the lost art of letter writing. Carlene Bauer was born and raised in New Jersey, where she grew up attending evangelical schools, churches, and youth groups. She knew early on she wanted to be a writer, and I think like every great writer, she started out by being a great reader. She graduated from Loyola College with a Bachelor of Arts in Writing and English and received her Master's in Nonfiction Writing from John Hopkins University Writing Seminars. She then moved to New York City and began her career in publishing at Simon & Schuster. She's written for Elle Magazine, Salon, N Plus One, The Village Voice, and The New York Times Magazine. Inspired after reading her book, I started to read Lowell's poetry again, and I wanted to know more about Flannery O'Connor. But mostly, I'm waiting for the next book by Carlene Bauer. So please join me in welcoming her. Hello. Hello. Um, how's that? First, um, I want to thank Ellen um, for a, a wonderful introduction, thank you, and um, for inviting me here, thank you. Um, now I have to read, which puts me in a difficult position because you have heard my work described, so now you're all going to have to see if I actually live up to what people have said about it. So, um, so what I'm going to read from, uh, the um, first two letters after um, a year into the friendship uh, between um, Francis and Bernard, um, and uh, they, uh, Bernard has visited Francis in New York, it's his first visit to her, and they're each writing to a friend about this visit. Um, so I'll begin. August 26, 1958, Ted, it's Bernard writing to his friend. Here are the books that you asked for, painting as a pastime, your love of Winston Churchill knows no bounds. According to this curio, he and I agree on what the soul of an artist requires. Quote, the first quality that is needed is audacity. You're reading like a plutocrat these days, Ted, heavy on the military history and light on novels. Is Kay that distracted by decorating your place that you need this entertainment? Although I suppose we'll now have sheets. But did we need sheets? While I'm writing, I'll tell you, that visit with Frances Reardon was quite wonderful. I took her all over the city. She hadn't dug into it yet, so we did it together. You have posited that she may have, as you like to say, a thing for me, but I don't think she does, and I am fairly sure I don't have one for her. I kept looking at her from different angles and examining my response. Various types of affection flared up in her presence, but not romance. I looked at her face while eating dinner at the Barbizon, that aqueduct built to conduct the flow of girls from Westchester straight into Connecticut while keeping them far above the catacombs full of dead dreams. Her pretty milkmaid face flowering among all the pretty iridescent silk stocking girls, and I did not find myself thinking her more beautiful than these, who were clearly nothing more than fish bread to stock the pond. 
Then I watched her kneel and cross herself at mass, and she was so intent and yet unselfconscious in her movements, it was as if I were watching a doe settle itself down in a green hush. Standing next to her in the pew, I felt that God truly lived within her. I didn't want to seduce her. I just wanted to settle down by her side and drink at the stream with her. And then I sang the Agnes Day too loudly for her taste, and she shushed me with a shush worthy of the gargoyles at the Bodleian. At lunch afterward, I must have asked her one too many questions, and she put down her knife and fork in exasperation and said, Bernard, God is not proctoring an exam. She is a girl, but she is also an old man, and I see that there is intractability in her heart that may never be shattered. Perhaps that is because she grew up among women who love harder than they think, and she has strengthened her innate intractability in order to keep tunneling toward a place where she could write undisturbed by the demands of conventional femininity. <clears throat> so she may always think harder than she loves. I make her smile, in spite of herself, I can tell. This appeals to the part of me that needs a conquest. That is romance enough, I think, in this particular situation. And she is wise. She might have picked that up from the women who raised her, though she might not admit it. I have not met many women who seem wise. I have met women who are shrewd, but that is a different story. Yours, Bernard. And this is a letter from Frances to her friend Claire about the same visit. August 26, 1958. Dear Claire, thank you for your letter. I wish you lived here, or I lived there. Well, no, I don't think Chicago is for me. Those people are too damn nice. How do you stand it? Bernard Elliott came to visit this past weekend. I think I can call him a friend. We could not stop talking. Talking to him was like talking to you, only I don't roll my eyes out of sheer exhaustion when I talk to you. So we talked. We spent five hours in a bar talking, two nights in a row. We talked and walked. He thinks walking is, and I quote, a purification, and so we walked all the way around the city, setting out from 63rd and Lexington, going down the east side, curving around the tip of the island, then all the way back up to the west side, through Central Park and home. He lived here a few years ago, and so I did enjoy seeing the city from all different angles and being shown them by someone who knew the ones that made the city look its best. Though I whined a little, you know me, I love to walk, but sometimes my slothful nature makes me want to sit down somewhere and then lie down on the floor with a box of crackers within reach. When I'm done, I'm done, especially in August. So when I whined once too loudly, he put us in a cab and took me for oysters at the oyster bar and insisted on buying a bottle of champagne at the counter where he told me what I thought I ought to look for in a husband. According to Bernard, and he says he's thought a lot about this, I need to marry somebody with money, which is not something he believes in usually, but he thinks I have the constitution for it, and the world, he said, needs my books. He says this, of course, having read one chapter of my first and only one, and after he's heard me say several times that I do not want to marry. If this had come from someone other than Bernard, I would have been offended, but here it amused, because he loves to pontificate and regrets not having had siblings he could pontificate too. His students aren't enough. And right after he made this pronouncement, he gave me a look like a taxidermist trying to decide where to start skinning and said, I can see exactly how you would have looked in pigtails, which means there is no enchantment afoot. So we went to the cloisters, we went to mass. He was too boisterous a singer during the Agnes Day and I elbowed him and reflexively whispered a shush, though I was touched because he really does seem grateful, even desperate for God's mercy. And he just elbowed me back, elbowed, elbowed me back and kept singing. He came to dinner two nights at the hen house, that's the Barbizon, a woman's hotel that she lives in, and the girls ate him up. He was so solicit solicitous of their aspirations, romantic and otherwise. Uh, people are oxygen to him. It's the part of him that can stand up in front of a classroom and teach. Whereas I think I, being around all those kids is going to give me some sort of disease of the mind, some degenerative disease contracted from contact with their undercooked brains. He told me later, half-jokingly, that he chatted with the girls because he wanted to thaw me out in front of them. It was hilarious, also a little maddening. I found myself jealous of those girls, those sorority girls, which makes no sense. Or maybe it was that I was jealous of his ability to charm and be gracious and make it seem effortless, make it seem an extension of his intelligence, while I tend to silently judge or make an untimely crack. Have you seen his picture somewhere in your reading? If not, big head, long straight nose, rubbery at the tip, wide forehead, large mouth, finished off by open American eyes and a mild shock of brown hair. The bigness of his head, the calm of it, filled with what it is filled with, brings to mind a marble bust that might be trying to get itself on a pedestal. But his mind and his heart seemed free of cruelty. As he talked, I saw them as two gears connected by the same belt, a belt running at top speed, 
frequently hiccuping and flapping at the speed and strain before correcting itself and grinding on. That is Bernard, my love to Bill, love Francis. So now there are some letters um, when they are in love. Um, and here's one from Francis to Claire, June 1st, 1960. Dear Claire, please forgive me for not having replied to your past two letters. Bernard and I have been engaging what might in a court of law be called an affair. I have seen him many nights for many weeks. I have slept in his bed. Claire, this person has gotten me into his bed, in a nightgown, I assure you, but into his bed. He says that he is in love with me. I believe that he thinks he is. He may actually be. I have not told him that I am in love with him, because I don't know what I think. He says he does not mind this. He knows me, he says, and he knows that I need to get my mind around it before I start making pronouncements. He is right, but I am scared. I am scared even to describe to you what it has felt like, the enjoyment I take in being described as something beautiful. I don't know if I love him, but I do know that I love being called beautiful by him. This is a confusion. I feel shame. I don't think that there's sin here. That's not it. Not even in forgetting, perhaps forgiving, that he says he does not believe. The sin will come because I sin against Bernard's hopes, or if I get hopes and then he sins against them. For my part, I am determined not to have hopes. I would rather be sinned against than sinning. I could not bear to hurt him. I feel like I am the only one who can know the truth about what is happening between us, and it's up to me to be on the lookout for any signs of his tiring or his illness. And I forgot to mention that in the book, um, uh, Bernard, like Robert Lowell, uh, is, uh, has, is manic depressive. So he occasionally has uh, episodes of this. So she mentions this. Do you remember that night after we gave that party and because our friend Ed was genially drunk, we insisted on his staying and then you went to bed and he insisted genially on kissing me and I found that I could not refuse him? I knew he was kissing me because he was upset about losing out on that fellowship and confused about his girlfriend's demands and wanted comfort and power the only way he was used to getting it away from the typewriter, from women. It was like giving blood to the Red Cross. I let him draw what he needed from me while I waited patiently, unmoved, for it to be over. And after he left, I went to the kitchen and ate a donut. There's some of that here. I find I can't say much more than this, to it about, than this about it to you, and you are my truest friend. I'm afraid I might offend you or annoy you and burden you with the dramatic irony of my confessions. I said one thing, but, Claire, you, but you, Claire, knew all along that it was just the opposite. This has already happened. I wrote you a letter a while back saying that I was not in love with him. And now look. I am just as idiotic about human love as the nuns who raised me. A normal woman would know what to feel and why she was feeling what she felt, or she'd just say to hell with feelings, I'll take the money and run. I don't know how these things work, and this is making me panic some. There's part of me that thinks Bernard might just get tired of me, and come September, when he has to tar start teaching, pack his desire for me away. You hear about these things. I know that he isn't like that, that he has to have the girl remove herself or be forcibly removed from the girl, but I do worry that I am a mirage in the middle of some spree. Please advise. Love, Francis. And so now uh, Bernard, later in the summer, writes uh, to Francis. He's in Maine with his friend Ted. July 10th, 1960. Dearest Francis, I wish you had come up here to Maine with me to visit Ted. He says hello. That girl, he says, is a serious girl. That girl will take a bad joke, look at you with pity, and then make a much better joke out of it. I think he is jealous of me, as he should be. A man always wants his friends to be a little in love with his beloved, too. There is a large bed here, right under a window, framed in pine branches, summer's frost, from which I can see the sea. And in the mornings, I think of what your bare arms, covered in freckles, would look like in the clear, bright water. In the afternoons, I wonder whether the salt water, heated by the sun, would stain your skin and leave behind a reticulation, an Irish articulation of Venusian sea foam, your freckles. I want to down them like oysters, having my fill on a rock that no one can find. Why did you have to be virtuous and stay in the city? I would have allowed you your own room, and then there would be, uh, I would have allowed you your own room. Um, sorry. Uh, plus, there are real oysters here that we have been downing like shots in some vinegar. I am tempted to write a whole letter full of things that will make you blush. I am tempted to write indecent things that will make you angry. But I have the soul of a Puritan, and this prevents me from letting my desires billow out in a more Baroque, black-velveted, Saudian manner. Correction, and how could I have made that mistake? A Puritan would be content to love an absence. 
I am not. I can only say this very artless, sweet-hearted thing, which is that you are velvet-skinned and freckled, and I will not be able to sleep tonight because of it. You're Bernard. And then he writes another letter because he can't help himself. July 11th, 1960. My love, I'm up and looking at the moon on the ocean and I'm thinking. The air around you is sometimes wary and chill. I think you are waiting for me to become bored with you. I think you think I have gone out of my mind a little, maybe. Please believe that I love you. There's nothing I can say to convince you. I know whatever I say will sound like ravings. Love letters are allowed to sound like ravings, but when you have a history of raving, that pass is revoked. I can imagine how I sounded in the letter I just sent you, but it's a pleasure for me to sing to you and to not care that it may sound like Mozart, a ridiculous fecundity of notes and a sweetness therein. I know you hate Mozart. I have many things to sing of because I have a friend I can call beautiful. I've always thought you were beautiful. I was stunned by your blue eyes at lunch at the colony that day, your eyes widening, laughing, listening, suspicious, fixed on me and never wandering. And everyone else there desiccated by drink, ambition, and fear. I know that's cool. I'm a little desiccated by drink myself. You had the radiance of someone who knew her worth and would not squander it. You did not rob anyone to feel that worth, I could tell. But by the end of that lunch, I think your final aloofness, a consequence of knowing your worth, must have put all those thoughts in the deep freeze. What did I hear when I sat next to you? A breeze and then heavy silence. A breeze and then heavy silence. A sound I could wind my watch by. Self-possession, both intellectual and spiritual, and a merriness tempered by a predilection to judge. I liked it. But after all my panting for ideal love, I was in the mood for a divertimento. Having spent hours, hours looking at you, hours touching you, I know the many ways in which you are beautiful. But you were my friend first, not an idea about art or Tolstoy or purity or blonde hair. And I think you are my friend still. I may not believe in God, but I do believe that Simone Weil is right when she commands us to see people as they are and not turn them into creatures of our imagination. I love your suspicion. It means that your mind is always sharpening it itself against the many lies of this world, but right now it is killing me. So I'm going to ask that you write me a letter convincing me that you believe me. You do not have to tell me that you are in love with me, and you do not have to tell me how you feel about me. You have to write and tell me that you believe I love you. You are Bernard. And Francis answers, July 15, 1960. Bernard, you're right. I don't know what to believe. I'm sorry that my suspicion is killing you. I know what I want to believe, which is that you are not in the grip of an infatuation. I want to believe that. I will, I will try to stop giving you a chill and wary air. The Hudson River says hello. It doesn't know what you see in New England's blustering surf. It thinks a body of water earns its majesty by knowing how to keep its own counsel. That said, it is very secret envious of something so effusive. Love, Francis. <clears throat> so that's from the book. Pardon me. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, if you don't mind, um, a little bit about how the book came to be, and then a little bit about faith, doubt, and love, which is what the book is kind of about. Um, so I want you to please excuse the fact that I'm reading because you did not come for an evening of free jazz. I don't think anybody wants to hear me speak extemporaneously. I don't. So, um, but I'll try to look up occasionally. Um, so Francis and Bernard. Um, I first learned that, uh, this is part of the English, this is like an English class, that portion of the, the talk. Um, I learned that <clears throat> Flannery O'Connor and Robert Lowell were friends years ago from a book uh, called The Life You Save May Be Your Own uh, by Paul Eli. And the book is a study of four American Catholic writers at mid-century. Um, Flann uh, Flannery O'Connor is one of them. The others are Dorothy Day, Walker Percy, and Thomas Merton. Um, and in the book, Eli says that O'Connor fell for Lowell at this writer's colony. This surprised me because... O'Connor was famously celibate, and she also wasn't a writer who ever turned her love life into another art project. So it was hard for me to imagine the two of them, Lowell and O'Connor, being friends, let alone lovers, uh, their temperaments being so different. Uh, Lowell was uh, brought up in Boston from Puritans, as Bernard is, um, very um, effusive, grandiose, delusional possibly, um, even when he wasn't ill, um, uh, a great deal of self-confidence, and O'Connor was from Georgia, middle-class family, not as well off as Lowell, but um, crank, um, and also uh, very aloof, and so... Um, little reactionary as well. And so it was interesting to think that they would have even, like I said, been friends. Um, so it's clear from their letters, and there aren't that many of them to each other in either of their collections, um, that they had great affection for each other. But if O'Connor did indeed fall for Lowell, she never made these feelings public. 
which left the door open for me to try to imagine what would have happened if people like these two actually had fallen in love with each other, because I'm really a 13-year-old girl at heart. <clears throat> so I borrowed from history, but I don't like to say this is historical fiction. Um, like I said, Francis and Bernard share family, professional, religious, and educational backgrounds with O'Connor and Lowell. And I did use uh, many events and details from their lives as foundation for the story. For example, Francis and Bernard meet like O'Connor and Lowell did at a writer's colony. Um, in real life, they met at Yaddo, which is a famous writer's colony. Um, and Francis, like O'Connor, was born Catholic and never departs from it. Uh, Bernard, like Lowell, converted to Catholicism in his 20s and then lost his faith after his first manic episode. Also, Bernard, like Lowell, uh, suffers from manic depression and was uh, is or was hospitalized several times because of it. Um, I also borrowed quite a bit of their temperaments and voices. So, like I said, Francis is a comic and a crank, and Bernard is a garrulous knight errant, not unlike Lowell. I didn't really want to be bound by the historical record. Um, so, for instance, O'Connor died at uh, 39 after living 15 years with lupus, and for various reasons, some of them feminist, I wanted my heroine to live. Um, and Lowell never did touch O'Connor. It is probably the case that no man ever touched her, um, but Bernard does, as you can gather from what I read. Um, so I wanted to write in such a way that even if you were familiar with the lives of Lowell and O'Connor, at a certain point you'd forget that they were the inspiration for these characters and you'd be fixated instead on the events transpiring between two people named Francis and Bernard. So it didn't begin as an epistolary novel. Um, it started as a third person omniscient, so I was writing about them objectively. Um, it wasn't first person, um, but the story wasn't as alive as I wanted to be. I had about 60 pages and I read over it and I thought this really actually sounds like a YA novel and I thought that's terrible. I mean, YA novels are not bad, but I was trying to write for adults, so I thought, I can't do this, I have to stop. So <clears throat> I put it, had to put it aside, and um, around the same time, a volume of letters between Robert Lowell and the poet Elizabeth Bishop was published. Uh, this book is called Words Into Air, and it's a, a collection of the letters that they wrote to each other over their lifetimes. And so watching those two writers navigate a lifelong friendship reminded me that letters could certainly be a vehicle for drama between characters. So I highly recommend that book, too. Um, it's a really lovely evocation of watching affection deepen and then sometimes fissuring over time. And also, there's literary gossip, um, which is also fun. Um, so in these letters between Lowell and Bishop, uh, there's an exchange in which Lowell, always a grandiose effuser, tells Elizabeth Bishop that she was the one might have been for him. Now, Bishop was a lesbian. Uh, and so she answers, she had no interest, romantic interest in Robert Lowell at all, but he, he felt so much for her that it sort of went off in this direction that it might not have, but she answers this with chastening pointed silence, doesn't even acknowledge it. <clears throat> and I, for me, I thought that that was an incredibly rich and poignant moment, um, so much going on there, and I thought, poor Robert Lowell, that he couldn't see what window he was flying straight into, and then poor Elizabeth Bishop, his friend, for having to clean up yet another pile of broken glass on her floor. And I mean, I should also mention that, anyway, that she had her own uh, problems too. But um, so I thought, what would it be like to be sort of like Bishop and aloof, reserved private woman like her, also like O'Connor, and then have to be caught up in the possibly delusional passion of someone like Lowell? And then what if you created a portrait of that relationship through letters? And I thought that letters would be really good because they require that you get to the heart of the matter. You can dispense with elements of traditional narrative whenever you want because that's what often happens in letters. You don't need to set a scene. You don't have to anchor the dialogue. And he said, she said, he said, she said. And then I also, which is fine, you know, but for this, somehow it wasn't working with this. It felt really, it felt, it felt like the worst parts of Mad Men. Like when you see them trying to really labor to be hysterically accurate and then you're not interested and I thought I can't do that. So um, also I thought letters would be a more forgiving form in which to tell a love story because um, everyone understands that these letters are a place where you can say so many things you can't ever really say face to face or in real life. Um, wild things, sweet things, silly things, unforgivable, um, unforgivable things, swollen with passion or a fire with rage. They allow for heightened emotions, and they would also allow for a bit more drama, maybe. In the space of two letters, you could have a world change, or you could have the plot thicken instantly. 
And also my hope is that it would allow the reader the frisson of being in the presence of unreliable narrators. I wanted the reader to experience a charge from never being sure whether they're getting the whole truth and from never being sure whether the characters are deluding themselves into or cheating themselves out of something. I wanted the reader to be able to listen to these characters as if they were jurors hearing testimony. Is she being overly cautious? Is he being overly optimistic? And how much of his optimism can be attributed to his illness? So my other aim was to write a love story that could not be easily dismissed as escapist entertainment. And I thought, was it possible to write a love story that was centered on two mortal adults who were not teenage vampires and make people care? Could I do that? Because I'm a little, I feel, well, that's a, whole other, that's a whole other talk that I'll sort of address here in a little bit. But um, so I also wanted to write about doubt. And so as, as Ellen said, I was raised evangelical. They do not allow for doubt ever at all. Um, and then I converted briefly to Catholicism because I thought they did, the Catholics. And now I no longer really believe. So I often say that I'm a recovering evangelical, a lapsed Catholic, and a wistful agnostic who could probably never call herself an atheist if by atheist we are talking about Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens. So in the novel, I tried to put two voices in dialogue, one an irreverent yet submissive faith, Francis, and the other a doubt filled with yearning, Bernard, voices inspired by O'Connor and Lowell, respectively. So I read deeper into their work after I lost my faith, so to speak, and I was struck at how hilarious and cantankerous O'Connor was. I highly recommend her letters. Um, they're, called, they're collected in a volume called The Habit of Being, and in some ways they're better than her sh short stories, which is a little bit blasphemous to say, but, um, but they're really a fantastic record of, of comic timing, but also deep and wise theological reflection. Um, so I read her letters. I read Lowell's letters, like Ellen. Um, uh, and uh, so I was just struck by um, how she was able to reconcile her sense of humor but her deep faith. Because to me, Christianity and impeccable comic timing had always seemed mutually exclusive. Um, and uh, I was also moved by how idealistic Lowell was. And this was someone who, you know, during the uh, Second World War, he was a conscientious objector. He converted... Um, to Catholicism, like I said, but then discarded it. He was constantly, when he was ill, just he would fall in love with girls like clockwork, and um, you know, ruined two marriages, kind of, and and just. But if if you read the letter, I mean, to me, it's 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 actually not anything to judge or sort of. It, it seems like I had I had sympathy for him in this sort of mad sort of search for perfection he could never find. So I wrote the novel in part because there's no structure to contemplate the possibility of believing again when you don't believe, or to contemplate the ramifications of doubt. So I, I didn't go to church, and I didn't really pray, and divinity school wasn't an option. And I had no satisfying outlet other than occasional conversations with sympathetic friends and strangers for the thoughts and questions you have about God or faith when you stop believing for the unfinished business, which of course may never be finished, which is what I found in talking to people. My sense is that many more of us than we hear about have this kind of unfinished business. You can be formerly Orthodox Jewish from Brooklyn, Islamic from New Jersey, Mormon from Idaho, Tennessee Baptist, Massachusetts Catholic, Texas Church of God, Staten Island Lutheran, they exist, um, California Seventh-day Adventist, Michigan Dutch Reformed, and you can all these, these are all people that I've known and talked to about this stuff, just a sample. And you can still wonder, even if the bad of religion outweighed the good for you sometimes, why are you still haunted by them both, the bad and the good? So it seems that for me at least, this might never be finished business, faith, for me. This is the second book I've written with belief as a subject, and it probably won't be the last. So as Ellen said, I wrote a memoir before the novel that told the story of growing up evangelical and then losing my religion altogether. So the idea was to show another side, of, another side of the Christian experience, one that wasn't often described in either religious or secular cultures, in literature or elsewhere, one that articulated the complexities of wanting to believe without wanting to submit to or propagate dogma. With the memoir, I thought, maybe I could do my part in some very small way to take the conversation back from both of the religious right and the reporters who regularly covered Christianity, specifically evangelical Christianity, as if they were witnessing a Mayan sacrifice they were too bewildered and horrified to sympathize with. Sympathize with. And also, ideally, it would be a potluck dinner in book form for anyone who'd ever sat in a sanctuary thinking that they really did love God, but they didn't love the groupthink he often came surrounded by. So a few months ago, a novel
who'd been raised Mormon, asked me if writing the second book, this novel, was analogous to prayer. And I hadn't thought of it that way while writing, but perhaps it was. Maybe it was a prayer from the purgatory the prodigal heart goes wandering in. There were moments while typing the novel, staring at the laptop screen, when I found myself wondering if St. Augustine was in right after all. Our hearts are restless until they rest in him. God. A line from Elizabeth Bishop's poem about the prodigal son also came to mind. But it took him a long time, finally, to make up his mind to go home. So could a person write themselves back into faith? Could they make up their mind in that way? Especially since the novel, as people like to say, poured out of me. Now, I have been for nearly all of my life a very slow writer who types with a white knuckle grip on her sentences. And I tend to roll my eyes when I hear writers say things like, it just poured out of me. Or once I started listening to the characters, they told me what to do. Whenever I hear these things, I think a lot of writers I know feel the same way. I think of those famous photographs of spiritualists from the 19th century or early 20th, and they're expectorating ectoplasm. Well, that's what they say, but really it's gauze. That's what I think of when I hear people say things like this, because these statements obscure the fact that writing is often really nothing more than consenting to give yourself an aneurysm for three to six hours a day. So unable to explain the relative ease and the relative fearlessness with which I proceeded, I had no choice to wonder if there was a force bigger than myself involved here, such as the Holy Spirit, who I don't think I'd ever been on intimate terms with. Then I would remember something a friend said to me, a friend said to me years ago when I was in the process of converting to Catholicism, his father had been a priest. So he sort of had, he could say this to me, what he's about to say. I mentioned to him that I'd gone to Mass and I'd seen a seeing eye dog that had been brought to church and the dog seemed radiant and calm. It was a black lab and it was sitting in the front of the church and the marble floor right in front of the altar. The whole service just seemed happy to be there. And so I mentioned this to my friend. I said, it's almost as if the dog contained the Holy Spirit. And my friend interrupted me and said, Holy Spirit, my ass, that dog's well trained. And so I thought, oh yeah, you're right. You're to- He's a philosophy professor. Anyway, so he won. He won. So, and I thought, well, maybe really I was the well-trained dog here. It wasn't the Holy Spirit, because having spent a lot of time white-knuckling sentences, I had probably trained myself to get this stuff going. So here is my friend telling me there was, of course, a logical explanation for what I wish to describe to the divine. And I felt a little embarrassed for wishing for benevolent, miraculous beyond, as I have felt a bit embarrassed post-church, even being still skeptically curious about his possible or its possible existence. But I wonder, sometimes I think I felt more embarrassed writing a love story than in writing about belief. I'm sitting on the subway. There are two things to illustrate this. I was sitting on the subway this past spring. I was riding home from work. I live in Brooklyn. I work in Manhattan. There were two women, probably about 27 or 28, standing in front of me. So I was sitting, and they were strap hanging. And they looked like very serious young women. They were very erect. They were talking very rapidly and with precision. And they had very nice dresses on. They were demure, you know, not too fancy. And one of them had just read Milan Kundera's Immortality and was recommending it to the other. And she said, it's not just a love story like the other novel he wrote, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And she seemed really sort of like haughty about this. And the other girl nodded, like, oh, yeah, right, love stories are terrible. And I thought, well, my book had just come out, and I wanted to say, like, what would you say about Anna Karenina? What would you say about War and Peace or all of Jane Austen or Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights or Doing the Obscure? You could go on. But I bit my tongue because the first law of the subway is never talk to anybody else on the subway, even though they did not seem that crazy. Um, So I just felt all these objections rising within me. And I thought, well, you know, that novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, I read it a long time ago. People seem to sell it as a philosophical meditation on the human condition, you know. And, you know, but they were disparaging it. And I thought I wanted to ask them, what did they mean also by saying that novel was just a love story? But I think we all know what that means. Sappy, solipsistic, two people going on and on about each other, soap operatically in purple prose. I hope I did not do that, but maybe I did. Um, And going on about each other rather than political, philosophical, or economic crises, shaking the world around them, looking inward, navel-gazing, not outward. Love stories, meaning romantic comedies with cardboard characters whose pains are wiped away by a happy ending that seems too good to be true, or too sodden with melancholy, not stoic or nihilistic enough to be true art. These girls also reminded me of something a critic has said of my book, that the book started out as an exploration of faith, but then the author fell victim to romanticism and let a love story take over. The critic was disappointed that this book turned into something that was just a love story. He wanted to know about these characters and their relation to God. He did not find the characters and their relation to each other sufficiently interesting. 
This stung. Maybe my book wasn't serious enough after all. Maybe he just thought I was in the end some girl writing fancy pants fan fiction. Maybe I should have thickened it up with more theological discussion. And I wondered also, what made a love story a less worthy subject for fiction? People didn't think that a long time ago, but I think they do think it now. And if a woman writes a serious novel about a love story, there's, is there a danger that it will be confused with Fifty Shades of Grey, which is Twilight meets Chicklet meets soft pornography? And is this why younger serious women, it seems to me younger serious American women writers, might be wary of plunging themselves into narratives that explore passion? Is it that certain trends in literary fiction have led the writer to want to be more in love with language than sentences than their characters? And I wonder also, do people think we've gotten to the end of what can be said about what, what men and women feel for each other? Or have we settled that question so thoroughly that there's no use exploring it? On the one hand, yes. You could argue that it's all been said before. But on the other hand, people will not stop falling in love. To ask that literature refuse that experience seems puritanical with a capital P. So this critic and these girls in the subway made me think of Roland Barthes, who's a French literary theorist, and he wrote a book published in 1977 called A Lover's Discourse. And in the book he writes that it is no longer the sexual which is indecent, it is the sentimental. We'd much rather hear about someone's sexual escapades than hear about their broken heart, he says. More about indecency and embarrassment. Over the summer I had to give a talk to some religion scholars about faith and writing, and I asked the theologian who invited me what he'd like me to speak on. And I've known him for a long time. He said, well, how about how not to embarrass yourself about when you're writing about God? And we laughed about this. I thought, that's a good question. And he didn't elaborate, but I think Flannery O'Connor knew of a few ways you could get yourself in trouble here. Quote, this is from her letters. I hate to say most of these prayers written by saints in an emotional state, she once wrote to a friend. You feel you are wearing somebody else's finery. I can never describe my heart as burning to the Lord who knows better without snickering. She was talking about what she called the pious style, vaporous hymns, meaningless raptures that further obscured what we could see of the face of God. But it seems to me that we are currently living in a moment, and we've been living in it, you know, maybe 30, 35 years, in which snickering is the default response to any sincere description of one's heart, because sincerity is often confused for the sentimental, which is often what we call any expression of emotion. And because of this confusion and out of some fear, I think, our culture makes it difficult to speak without pieties and without cliches the complex, complex realities of romantic love and belief. Maybe we don't want to appear delusional, weak, undone, fanciful, childish, or naive. We want the certainties of our cynicisms, but we do not like questions put to the institutions of love and religion, lest they finally be exposed as flawed receptacles for our fragile hopes. And what I think is related to the sphere of what might happen if we looked hard at romantic love and faith is a difficulty we seem to have as Americans of speaking openly and without pessimism of one's doubt. And you could count doubt as a kind of sincerity if you are, in one way, being honest about what you do and do not know. I think religious doubt in particular, I think, is still seen as some kind of sin, and this is maybe the sin of not taking a side. Maybe we think doubt in any form is like flying through life with more turbulence in your heart than is bearable. I think in many ways it's riskier to lay yourself open as someone who's not quite sure what they believe without wanting to shield yourself with the term atheist. It's much easier, easier to explain why you are, or emphatically not, religious than to admit a want for a God you are not sure exists, or to explain why you are still compelled by ethical frameworks that have their roots in religion rather than philosophy, even though you are not sure of the worth of organized religion. Doubt, yes, can render us unstable, squirrely, surly, but it can also, I think, be a state of waiting in which we stand curious and expectant. In doubt, like love, one can be wistful, wary, exhausted, even greedy, for proof, maybe. In doubt, we have not said no, we have merely not said yes to what is currently in front of us because we are holding out for another version. And in this way, is it a lot, it's a lot like belief. We could see doubt as an act of hope, which is what love is. It is a slippery state to try to evoke. To try to articulate it, the response might be deaf ears, outrage, willful misreading. It doesn't explode like an action movie or fit in a tweet. If you're a moderate Republican, John Boehner doesn't want to hear about your doubt. The Tea Party doesn't want to hear about it either. But the difficulty of describing being caught between ambivalence and commitment may mean it's all the more necessary to do it, to articulate the doubt. So many people I've known who have either believed or used to believe live a searching doubt. All of us pass through it daily as we parent, as we vote, as we marry, as we fight for our country, as we muddle through. It is perhaps one of the most human sounds we can make. And so I think we might need to hear more of it. So that's my talk.
Oh, thank you all. Thank you.